Oops. Okay, so we are talking about gopher tortoises today. Here's a little bit more about me. I think I told you pretty much most of the things I do here. I have an undergraduate degree in environmental studies from SUNY of Buffalo. So I'm from the Great White North originally. Um, I've been down here a little over, wow, gosh, a little over 25 years now. Um, I also had a stint as a physician. So I did my medical training out in Seattle. And then as I mentioned about three and a half years ago, I decided to come back to teaching about our environment. Um, and started working here at the Extension Office. I actually live in Oscar Shear State Park with my husband, who's the park manager, so that's been fabulous. I've lived there for over 20 years now, and we have two kids and two dogs and lots of other animals all crammed into a house right now uh, there at the park. So in case any of you are new to what Extension is, I just give you a few words about Extension. Um, I'm hoping you've all had the opportunity to come to our building when we were all out and about in public. Um, but if you haven't, we have a wonderful building here in Twin Lakes Park on Clark Road in Sarasota County. And the Extension offices are in every single county in the state of Florida. We are a partnership between University of Florida, the USDA, and the county that we're in. And really our job, our mission is to take the research and information that's done at University of Florida and extend it out into our community in ways to help you make your lives better. So here at Sarasota County, we have a really large, wonderful extension office with lots of people doing lots of different things. So on your screen, you just see a few of the different program areas that we offer classes in and offer community um, information and help from. So please feel free to contact us if you need any help or um, take one of our other classes. Most of our classes are free or low cost to the public. Here's some of the programs we do. So you may be involved in some of these or have heard of them. Up on the upper right is my Florida Master Naturalist program that I am uh, involved in teaching. <laughs> Excuse me a minute. <clears throat> And then we just like to put in a slide to remind you to take your census if you hadn't, because you are more than just a number, you matter. And this helps with funding to your community. So it's really important to take your census online if you haven't. All right, so let's get started with our gopher tortoise. So um, these are the things I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna talk for probably about 45, 50 minutes, and then you'll have 15 or so minutes for questions and answers. So gopher tortoise identification, natural history, where he lives, um, how important their burrows are. We're gonna look at some gopher tortoise scat and tracks. We're gonna talk about why is this organism, why is this species so important, especially here in Florida, and what are the threats to our population of gopher tortoises in Florida? And then we're going to talk about how the gopher tortoise is being protected and maybe some ways you could help gopher tortoises as well. All right, so let's talk about how you would identify a gopher tortoise. Um, I bet a lot of you have seen a gopher tortoise before. They aren't all that uncommon to see. They are, tortoises are terrestrial turtles. So they are, they are a turtle, but they are a turtle that spends their life on land. Most of our other turtles in the state of Florida are either sea turtles. We actually have five species of sea turtles that come to Florida. And we have other freshwater aquatic turtles. Um, so here in Florida, our gopher tortoise is really the only terrestrial turtle other than the box turtle, which we'll talk a little bit about in a few minutes. Adult gopher tortoises average 10 inches long and up to 15 pounds. Um, that's a picture there of one I took at Oscar Shear State Park. We have a lot of them at Oscar Shear. That one's probably a pretty good sized adult. I would say that one was probably eight, maybe nine inches long, and I didn't pick him or her up to weigh him or her, so I can't tell you if it was a girl or a boy or how much it weighed, but it was a good size gopher tortoise. As you can see, gopher tortoises have like a dome shell, so their shell is rounded, and they have what we call an unhinged plastron. So the plastron is the bottom shell. 
Turtles like the box turtle have a hinge plastron, meaning they can close it up. They, box turtles can pull their head and all four feet into their shell, and then they can close their bottom shell against the top shell as a protective measure. Gopher tortoises cannot do that. They don't have any hinging of that plastron or bottom shell, so they just have a single piece bottom shell. And it is, um, you can look at the bottom shell, the plastron, to determine whether or not a gopher tortoise is a male or a female. If gopher tortoises are a male, their bottom shell is concave. It has an indentation into it. That's so they can mount the females and make babies. A female's bottom shell for a gopher tortoise is just nice and flat. Now we're not supposed to pick them up. It's actually illegal to handle them. Um, but if you ever saw a gopher tortoise shell, you'd be able to tell now if it was a shell from a boy or a girl. Um, their carapace, which is what we call their top shell, is pretty much unmarked. Like it doesn't have really cool coloration or patterns on it. It's just sort of a dull brownish gray, especially once they become adults. They have flat shovel-like front feet. So you can sort of see their front feet in this picture. And there's another picture coming up that you can see them even better. But they look a little bit like elephant legs. They have really thick skin. Their feet are really, um, really big for the size of their body. And they have good sized nails on their feet as well. And all of that is adaptations for digging their burrow, which is where they live. Um, they also have really short, stubby back legs that are sort of cute and also look very much like elephant legs. Oops, all right. Here we go. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about them. They have a round face with a little bit of a beak on, um, on the end of their face. So they don't have teeth, but they have a beak that helps them to grab the plants that they eat. Um, they are herbivores, so they are completely a plant eating species. And I listed some of their favorite plants that they like. Um, they really like native grasses that you would find in their habitat, like wire grass. And then that top picture is gopher apple. Gopher apple is one of their favorite foods, and that's a picture of it right before it blooms, and then it makes little tiny apples that they like to eat. Um, they like to eat a number of different varieties of legumes. There are native uh, legume or pea plants that grow in their habitat that they like to eat. And then on the bottom picture, that's a prickly pear cactus. And so um, whenever I have a group out in nature and we find a prickly pear cactus near, near a gopher tortoise hole or burrow, I talk about how that's why their beak is adapted the way it is, or not why, but the beak helps them to be able to eat cactus, which you and I couldn't eat unless we peeled it and got all those prickly parts off. But a gopher tortoise is fine with just chewing on a cactus leaf but they really like the prickly pear fruit. So those beautiful yellow flowers there, um, will once pollinated, will turn into sort of a purplish pear-shaped object, and that's the fruit of the cactus, and it is delicious. Wildlife really like it. It's hard to actually find them because wildlife usually eat them before we see them. Uh, gopher tortoises are also ectothermic. That's our fancy science word for being cold-blooded. And so like many of our reptiles, they need to sit in the sun in order to warm up their body and get their metabolism working. So um, you will often find them, especially on cooler days, they'll either stay in their burrows on cooler days or they'll come out and they'll sit in the sun. Usually their burrows will have an open area um, at the front of the burrow where there's just this mound of sand that we call the apron, and it's a perfect place for the gopher tortoises to sit and warm up in on cool days. And they can live 40 to 60 years in the wild and even double that in captivity. So most tortoises, um, our terrestrial turtles are long lived. Um, some of the tortoises from Africa can live over 120 years. So 
Uh, they are a very long-lived species, although their life will be shorter if they're in the wild, just because they have more they have to deal with. So here's a sweet little baby gopher tortoise that I was lucky enough to get a picture of a few years ago. I think I was at, I think I was at Curry, no, I wasn't at Curry Creek. I was at Minnesota Scrub. Um, it's a county park sort of in the southern portion of our county. And um, I also recently saw a gopher tortoise baby, I think at Oscar Shearer as well. Um, they are tiny, so the one in that picture was maybe, I would say, one and a half to two inches at the yeah. most. Um, so that was a really new, probably just a few day old baby tortoise. Um, so let's talk about, first of all, the adult males and females. So I talked about how you can tell the males and females apart based on whether or not the bottom shell is concave or not. Um, males also have a longer tail. And then they have, and you can't really see it in this picture on the bottom, but they have what's called a gular horn, which is sort of this part that sticks out underneath their chin from their bottom shell. And it is longer and more pronounced in the males of the gopher tortoises. And I like to think of it sort of like a can opener. Basically, they use it to try to tip each other over when they're fighting for territory or females. So it's almost like they'll try to like get a can opener in under that other gopher to tortoise that they're fighting and then they'll flip him over. Um, I know online, if you wanna see a video of this, they are videos online that you could Google and look for it. It's sort of funny. Uh, so the young are also, as you can tell by that top picture, they are a little bit brighter in color. They're about, they're yellow, orangish with that darker outline to what is called their scoots, which are those individual plates on their shell. Those scoots actually grow and shed as the tortoise grows. And the shell can be soft for a number of years. Um, so the gopher tortoise babies are really susceptible to being injured or eaten, especially in that first year as their shell is still hardening. Um, gopher tortoises breed from March to October, although down here in Florida, they pretty much breed a little bit earlier in that, that window. Um, they will dig their burrows right around that time in May, June. So right now they're either digging their burrows or they are finishing digging their burrows and laying their eggs. They lay about five to nine round eggs and they are really pretty much the size of a ping pong ball. And they like to lay their eggs in the apron, that mound of sand at the front of their burrow door, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. It takes about 80 to 110 days before the young hatch. So it just depends on when they actually laid the eggs and then you figure like three or maybe almost four months out before the eggs are gonna hatch into those juvenile tortoises. And the moms don't stick around. The moms don't provide any protection or maternal care for those baby tortoises. They're on their own from day one. So let's talk a little bit more about where gopher tortoises are actually found. Um, so you can see on this picture here, they're found throughout the green and the gold area. Uh, it is one of only five tortoises that are in North America, and it is the only tortoise east of the Mississippi River, so they're pretty special. And here in Florida, they do occur in all 67 counties in our state. This is where they like to live. They really like to live in high, dry, sandy, upland landscapes. So Uplands basically means here in Florida uh, an, a habitat or ecosystem that is high enough above sea level or the water table that you're going to have those dry sandy soils. Often, if you think about the Lake Wales Ridge, if you've been there, um, that's sort of the part of Florida that was never underwater. Um, so it is a perfect habitat. And here in our county, if you're from Sarasota County, 
Um, Oscar Shearer is a great habitat for gopher tortoises. A lot of our county parks have some upland habitat that's good for gopher tortoises. And even many of our neighborhoods will actually have gopher tortoises in them as well. Um, they basically like to live where we like to live. So we're going to talk about uh, how human development and building of houses and other like structures has really limited the amount of habitat available for our gopher tortoises because one of the best places to build buildings is also on dry land that the water percolates or drains through easily. Um, gopher tortoises need about 30% herbaceous ground cover. So that's like herbaceous ground cover is sort of the soft green plants that don't have woody stems. So they need, if you look at an overall area where a gopher tortoise might live, they need at least 30% of that area as like that nice soft green stuff they can eat. Um, and as I mentioned often, the native grasses are their favorite food. They need the water table to, the best is to have the water table be at least 18 inches below the surface because think they're gonna dig their burrow. So they don't wanna dig their burrow in an area where it's just gonna flood because the water table is so close to the surface. And we also, as biologists, we look at canopy cover. So canopy cover is, if you look up, how much percentage of the area you're looking at is covered by tree canopy. So best for gopher tortoises is less than 40% tree canopy cover. Because they need a lot of open areas, not only so grasses can grow, but also so the sun can get down to the ground so those gopher tortoises can warm their temperature up by basking in the sun. So this picture that we're looking at is from Oscar Shear. It's one of the scrubby flatwood areas in Oscar Shear. You can see there's a variety of native herbaceous ground cover there. I see some grasses, I see some low growing oaks, um, probably some gopher apple either in this picture or right near it. You see that there is a lot of open um, sandy spots and there's not very much canopy cover. In fact, in this picture, you only see that one taller tree until you get way in the far back of the picture. So this is wonderful gopher tortoise habitat, that picture that we're looking at. Um, also prescribed fire is often an important maintenance tool where gopher tortoises live. Uh, most of the upland environments that they would live in would historically have burned because of fire started by lightning and that helps to keep those ground, um, those open areas on the ground available to them. It also, um, fire will help some of those native grasses to seed and it also keeps um, the canopy cover reduced. So in areas where now we put out fires because we have a lot of human homes and we don't want our human homes to burn, often land managers will have to do prescribed fires where they are burning an area for the health of the ecosystem and the wildlife that lives there, um, but also keeping the people safe as well. Scrub ecosystems are what we call an imperiled ecosystem. So this is an ecosystem that is threatened. There's, we have lost a huge, in fact, the majority of scrub in Florida has been lost to development or agriculture. So it is important to protect the scrub ecosystem that is left because we have some of these species that um, either only live in the scrub ecosystem like the scrub jays or prefer to live in this type of ecosystem like the gopher tortoise. All right, so let's talk a little bit about their burrows. They spend about 80% of their time in their burrow. So they're fine with COVID-19 because they're like safer at home anyways. Um, the burrows average about six feet deep and about 15 feet long. But there is the longest burrow on record was measured at 47 feet. So they really utilize those strong legs and those sharp claws to dig these amazing burrows. The opening of their burrow is a half moon or half circle shape and it's really usually about the same size and shape as their shell, which you can see in that bottom picture. 
So the gopher tortoise pretty much digs out, especially the opening of its burrow, to just about fit it. And then if it's trying to escape predators, it can actually go into the burrow and turn itself sideways. And then just its hard shell is basically acting as the door to its burrow. And that's a great um, protective mechanism from anything that's trying to get it. Um, the burrow is a safe place, not only from predators, but also from weather and from fire. So what's really interesting to me is um, that gopher tortoise burrows stay at about the same temperature and about the same humidity year round. I don't know how they do it. It's an amazing thing. Wildlife and nature are just amazing, but somehow the gopher tortoises know just how deep and how far to dig their burrow so that it maintains pretty much a constant temperature and humidity. And so if it's too uncomfortable for them outdoors, if it's too cold or the humidity isn't just right, then they can go into that burrow to be more comfortable. And obviously they can go in there to escape from predators or from a fire that's going through as well. Um, the apron is the mound of soft sand in front where they either like to bask or the females like to lay their eggs. Uh, usually gopher tortoises have more than one active burrow. So each burrow only has one opening. There's not like an entrance and an exit. It's just one opening, but they will use multiple burrows. They will dig and then use multiple burrows, sometimes at the same time even. Sometimes they'll move from one and for some reason they just want a new house and they'll build another one further down the trail and either use them both or move on to that one. There we go. Okay, so the burrows are really important, not just to the gopher tortoise. Um, research has been done that has shown that 350 or more different species actually use gopher tortoise burrows. So the, I believe the research also showed that up to 10 different species at one time would use a single gopher tortoise burrow. So it's almost like a condo in there. Um, there can sometimes be separate little pockets where other animals might be living or they might be coming in to lay their eggs or be more comfortable in the heat of the day or escape a fire. So really amazing to me. We call these species commensals because they're helping each other out. So we have a picture of a rabbit, a mouse. I have a couple snakes from Oscar Shear pictured there because so many different types of mammals, reptiles, <coughs> amphibians, um, and even invertebrates like insects will go into the gopher tortoise burrow and use it for a variety of reasons. There are four vertebrates that are listed as threatened or endangered that utilize the burrow, the gopher frog, the eastern indigo snake, let me see if I remember who else, I'm going to look at my list, um, I believe, here we go, the Florida mouse and the Florida pine snake. So all four of those are actually on the endangered list. Uh, and so if we lose the gopher tortoise and we lose gopher tortoise burrows, we would also lose for sure those um, species, if not even more. And so we call the gopher tortoise a keystone species. So we have a picture of an old bridge there. If, uh, if you're my age or older, you remember when bridges were built from bricks and stone. And the keystone is sort of that triangular stone at the top of the arch. And pretty much all of those other bricks or stones in the arch are sort of balanced and leaning against the keystone for support. So if you pull the keystone out, the bridge collapses. And it's the same with these animals that we call keystone species. If we were to lose that animal, something about it or how it lives would affect so much of the ecosystem that it would almost act like a collapsing of the ecosystem. So really important um, to protect these species, not just for the gopher tortoise itself, but for all these other 350 plus animals that utilize its burrow and some of them that actually 
need to have the burrow in order to continue their lives. Gopher tortoises, oh, there's a picture of the apron right there. So that's a gopher tortoise burrow in Oscar Shear. That's a pretty good sized apron. That's one of the biggest aprons I've seen. So you can see the nice half moon um, gopher tortoise burrow opening there and then a large apron out front. Um, so this is the soft sand that's been dug out to create the burrow. Um, I think this is the one, so last year when I was teaching um, an elementary school program at Oscar Shear, which we had field trips there multiple days for multiple weeks in a row, um, every morning that we had a field trip, we would go out there and there would be a coach whip snake either Ooh. sticking its head out of the burrow or laying across that apron. Coach whips are amazing. It was actually the first one I had ever seen. They have a black head that transitions into a khaki colored body. They are just beautiful. And the coach whip snake that I saw utilizing this burrow was, I would say it was a good four feet long. So really a beautiful snake. Even if you don't love snakes, it's a beautiful snake. And they're important. So um, as you can see from the apron, the sand is a lot softer than the surrounding area. So once again, it's a great place for the female gopher tortoises to bury their eggs. The sun, the, the aprons are always in the sun. I've never seen an apron that isn't in the sun. And so it's also a great place for the gopher tortoise to bask and warm up its body. Other important things um, that the gopher tortoise does for our ecosystems, they disperse seeds. So they eat a lot of, you know, those plants. And if they eat the seeds of the plants, sometimes the seeds will just pass right through their digestive tract. And so they're moving those seeds around and basically planting new plants. As they burrow, um, that actually, the act of burrowing actually returns leach nutrients to the soil. So they might be bringing up sand and soil that is deeper down um, that has more nutrients in it and then bringing that up to the surface again. And then the mounds provide a new place for plant growth. So you can see um, around the apron and behind the burrow, this is a great place. The plants are all growing. And if this, when this gopher tortoise leaves this burrow for a different one, plants will start to grow in that apron too. Once again, it's probably got more nutrients in that apron than some of the surrounding soil does. So I mentioned that I was going to talk to you a little bit more about a box turtle. I'm not going to tell you too much more about box turtles, but there's a picture of one. So box turtles are the only other turtle native to Florida that live on the land. They aren't a true tortoise. They are actually considered a pond turtle, but they are found on land a lot. And so if you find a turtle sort of in, in fact, you wouldn't even necessarily find box turtles in a dry area. But this is the other turtle that you're more likely to find on land. Of course, our aquatic turtles like cooters spend most of their time in like a pond or a lake or a river, but they can be on land occasionally as well. Um, they, box turtles and gopher tortoises don't really look alike. Box turtles are smaller. You can see their shell is quite brilliantly patterned. So you're probably not going to confuse the two of them, but they might be living in the same area. And then the other species that we might confuse a gopher tortoise with would be an armadillo, not based on what they look like, but just based on their hole or their burrow. So once again, you have on the bottom left, you have that gopher tortoise burrow. It's a nice half moon shape. Think about the habitat. Once again, they're gonna tend to be in dry, sandy soil. Whereas on your right, you have a armadillo built burrow or armadillo hole. They will tend to be perfectly circular and they tend to be pretty steep as well. It just depends on where they're digging, but the, the armadillo burrows tend to sort of drop down quickly, whereas the gopher tortoise burrow is a little less steep. Not that you would wanna be getting too close or sticking your hand in either of those to figure that out. <coughs> 
And here's some pictures of gopher tortoise tracks. I took these, uh, oh, I don't know, probably in March um, when I was having to spend more time at home. I got out into the park and took a lot of photos. So these are some gopher tortoise tracks in the very dry, sandy soil. You can see that they have what we call symmetrical gait pattern. So you can sort of tell how wide they are by looking at that space in between the two um, lines of tracks. So you're seeing the right foot and then the left foot, and you're gonna see the right and left foot just parallel each other in these nice lines. Sometimes you will see a tail drag mark in the sand as well. These pictures, I don't think I see it, um, but the males will have a longer tail. So if it's a female, it's not as likely that you'll see a tail mark um, dragging through the sand. Here's a picture of gopher tortoise scat. So um, this is always fun for me to talk about. One of my favorite topics, probably because I work a lot with kids and this is just so exciting to kids, um, for sure. They all love to talk about poop. Um, so gopher tortoise scat is about two to three inches long. Once again, depending on the size of the gopher tortoise, if it's a baby gopher tortoise, it won't be that big, but adult gopher tortoise scat is about two to three inches long. And I don't know, maybe about an inch wide. Um, this, is, this is a picture of one that I found and took a picture of. Uh, this scat is um, probably within 24 hours old because it still looks a little um, wetter, but basically all that's in that scat is dried, undigested grass. So if you pull it apart, it just looks like hay. It doesn't smell like poop. It doesn't really look like poop. Um, it just looks like a pile of undigested hay because really that's what they are generally going to be eating is grasses. So if you see this around, you know you have a gopher tortoise in your neighborhood. So let's transition into talking about, um, talking about neighborhoods and threats to the gopher tortoise population. So like with most of our wildlife, um, some of the biggest threats to almost all species of wildlife is habitat loss and fragmentation. So I always like to include that word fragmentation because it's not just about losing chunks of habitat. It's also a problem if the chunks of habitat that are remaining are too small to hold a viable population. So if you, you know, it's great if you have a gopher tortoise in your backyard and you live in a neighborhood and you're being a good gopher tortoise friend, but if there isn't another gopher tortoise anywhere near and there isn't any habitat anywhere near for another gopher tortoise, well, then your friend is only gonna be along for his or her lifespan. So when we talk about, you know, threats to the population, we have to think not only is there enough habitat but is there enough habitat in a large enough space that it will hold a viable population? And just a male and a female is not a viable population. I mean, a male and a female will obviously make babies, but then we have to think about genetic diversity. So is there enough different groups of tortoises that there can be enough mixing of the DNA so we don't have inbreeding? So these are all things to think about when we start thinking about how do we protect and conserve for gopher tortoises in the future. Um, so residential home development, clearly a threat to the population. As I mentioned, um, we love to develop those dry, upland, sandy environments because they drain water really easily. Um, you know, we also love to suppress fires because we worry about our human structures if there is a fire, but fire suppression has really become a problem for a lot of our natural habitats in Florida. So we need to find that balance. Obviously, we don't wanna have a wildfire that causes a problem for our homes and businesses, but if we suppress fire, then we actually build up fuel in our natural areas that if there is a lightning strike, there's more likely to be a chance of an out of control wildfire. So if we do prescribed burns in the areas that we're trying to maintain wildlife habitat, 
we are keeping the wildlife safe and keeping a home for the wildlife, but we're also helping our human structures be safe by decreasing the amount of fuel in those natural areas. And then of course, road mortality is an issue for many of our turtles, not just our gopher tortoise, but I'm sure you've seen, unfortunately, I, I think just driving between my home and the office, which I now have had the chance to do a little bit, I've seen at least five turtles in the, I probably live about eight miles away from the office, um, dead on the side of the road. So road mortality is an issue for our turtles. They will try to cross roads and of course they can't get out of the way of our vehicles very well. So you guys, if you keep coming to my presentations, you'll get tired of these slides because I show these slides in almost all of my presentations. I'm sure some of you are already nodding your heads because you've seen them before. So here we go. You can take a little mental break if you've seen them already. Um, but I like to show these maps because I, I just think for me personally, they were very eye opening. And so I think they really tell a story about what could happen in our future if we don't choose to make some changes or to help changes be made so that this story has a different ending. So on the left of your screen, you have a map of Florida from 2010, from um, probably from census data, I would guess. And it's basically showing all of the red dots are developed areas. And then the light green and dark green are areas that are protected either in agriculture or not, meaning, you know, you can see the Everglades there is protected. Um, so we're really looking at the difference between red and green. If you look at the right hand side, you have what is what the trend is that if we don't change the story, this is what is expected for 2070. And you can see there's still quite a lot of protected area, but not as much. And then what I really want you to think about is think about some of our larger species of wildlife, like panthers, like bears. They need hundreds, the males of those species sometimes need hundreds of miles um, in, sorry, not hundreds of miles, hundreds of acres in home range. And so they need to travel through long distances in order to find food and females to mate with. And so there aren't a lot of wildlife corridors left when we look at that 2070 map. So just thinking about where is the wildlife going to go? Is there a way that we can develop smarter and conserve better so that we are protecting for these species? And then I like to follow it up because um, I'm with Sarasota County. So I think a lot of us on the call are Sarasota County or nearby residents. Um, but if you're not, the story might be the same wherever you are. Um, I like to show a map. This is actually from our Sarasota County demographics person who has taken the census data in those 10 year blocks um, from when the census was done every 10 years and basically indicated this is 1950. And so the blue on this map is residential units built 1950 or earlier. So you can see sort of at the top of the screen, you see basically the downtown Sarasota area. Um, this is right here is sort of the Venice area where the city of Venice is. And then over here is where the city of Northport is, which right in 1950, you don't really see hardly any development there. So I'm not going to take us through 10 years by 10 years by 10 years, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump you forward to the most recent census data, which was about 10 years ago. And here the green is anything that was built in 2001 to 2010, and the blue is anything before 2010. So basically all the blue and green are residential units. So a huge change for our county, which is happening all over the state of Florida, more to more or less degrees, depending on what county you're in. But it just continues to tell that story that as more people come here, as we develop our county to provide homes and businesses for the people that are moving here, can we keep land aside? Can we keep ecosystems, habitats, and wildlife in mind? 
And if you look at our population there, so the first number down at the bottom of your screen was the population from that first map in 1950. This is the population in 2010, and I think we're gonna be close to, or maybe even over half a million people for 2020. Wow. Yeah, wow is right. <laughs> so that's why I like to show these. That's, that's pretty much what I'm expecting is the big wow. Um, and then here's the last one on demographics, and then we'll go back to the gopher tortoise. But um, these are four counties, and this is just uh, population projections from 2020. Here we go, from 2020 here to 2045. So you can see we are expected to hit um, 540,000 or over by 2045. Um, that's an increase of 25% in our population, which is the 21st highest in the state out of 67. So we're not growing as rapidly as some counties, but we're growing more rapidly than like two thirds of the counties in the state. Go for tortoise, upper, tor upper respiratory tract disease. It's caused by a bacteria called mycoplasma. We also can get uh, pneumonia from a mycoplasma bacteria, but it's a different mycoplasma, so we can't give each other um, this respiratory tract disease, but gopher tortoises can give it to another gopher tortoise. It causes runny, eye, runny nose, watery eyes, swollen eyelids, and wheezing, um, or they can be asymptomatic carriers where they don't have any symptoms, but they can give it to another gopher tortoise. Um, the disease may affect their energy, their feeding behavior, and whether or not they choose to bask in the sun. Like sometimes when they're sick, they'll actually go out and bask in the middle of the night, which obviously isn't helping them. It's, it's just that they're really sick and they're really confused. So this can be fatal for them. And as I mentioned, it is contagious to other gopher tortoises. So this is one of the reasons why you never wanna relocate a gopher tortoise on your own. First of all, it's completely illegal. You can't do that, but you wouldn't want to because if this gopher tortoise is sick and you move it somewhere um, to where there are other gopher tortoises that aren't sick, it can infect a whole bunch of other gopher tortoises. So this, we are seeing this affect the population of gopher tortoises. Some of the other threats to them, dogs can be a problem for gopher tortoises. So when you're in a natural area or if you know there are gopher tortoises in your neighborhood, um, please make sure you keep your dogs on a leash. Sarasota County does have a leash law anyways. Um, dogs will try to attack gopher tortoises and have been known to um, injure them or kill them. Invasive species are also a problem. So the picture on the bottom of your screen is a black spiny-tailed iguana. This is the iguana that is most commonly found currently in Sarasota County. It's not as showy as the green iguanas, but we have quite a few of these in places like Shamrock Park and Lemon Bay. And they will live in the gopher tortoise burrows. They will eat gopher tortoise eggs. They'll eat scrub jay eggs. They're great climbers. So they are a problem for a variety of our native species. Um, so we never want to release any pets out into the wild because it's not safe. Well, if it's our own pet like our dog, it's not as safe for our dogs. But if it's a pet like a reptile, it's certainly not safe for that reptile or for the native species. And then um, tortoises have been known to be harvested for food. Um, also, previously, decades ago, they used to do tortoise races. And so if they raced a tortoise, who knows what they would do with the tortoise afterwards. So these are now activities that are considered illegal. So let's talk about how the gopher tortoise is being protected. So um, this is a picture of Polly on your screen. Both of these pictures are Polly. She is what's called a waif tortoise, W-A-I-F. She is in the waif program, which you see um, a, uh, a link to on your screen. Um, if Cassidy's still with us, she's going to copy these links into the chat box in case you wanted to go to any of these different links and learn more information. You can't click on them on the slide that you're looking at, but if she puts them in the chat box, you'll be able to click on them in there. 
So the WAIF program is specifically for tortoises that have been injured and are not releasable back to the wild. And usually they are put at sites um, that either are what we call recipient sites that can help house the tortoise and care for it. And often those recipient sites are educational sites. So Polly came to visit me back when I first um, did a Wild Sarasota Gopher Tortoise program here at the office a number of years ago. And as you can see, she is missing one of her legs. And so she is in the WAIF program because she can't be released to the wild. She is otherwise healthy, but she is missing a leg, so she cannot feed herself well at all. And she is missing her leg because it got chewed off by someone's dog. So she is a prime example of how, um, and I have two dogs and I love them dearly, but if I'm walking them and they see a gopher tortoise, they will go for that gopher tortoise. So, so important to keep our dogs on leashes to protect our wildlife. Gopher tortoises are federally listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act, but only in the portion of their range that occurs um, more to the east. Uh, because there's plenty of them in the western part of their range. And then they are state designated as threatened here in Florida since 2007. So in our state, they definitely are protected both state and federally. Um, there are the links to both the WAIF program and the recipient site program. The recipient site is a program for landowners that have gopher tortoise habitat on their property and want to be the recipients of gopher tortoises, not necessarily like Polly, although that's a possibility, but also gopher tortoises that need to be relocated from land that is being developed. And so if you are interested in being part of that recipient site program, um, it's a program run through Fish and Wildlife or FWC. They come out, they assess your land, they work with you to determine what you need to do to manage your land for gopher tortoises. And then you may be selected to have gopher tortoises be relocated to your land. Um, like I mentioned, gopher tortoises are protected. Um, you cannot harm them. You cannot fill up their burrows. You cannot block their burrows. You cannot harass them. Um, so you can't really do anything that affects their life um, unless you are permitted for a specific activity. Um, so this is where you would get permits if you needed to somehow interact with gopher tortoises, either from a development standpoint or from an educational standpoint. Um, that's all managed by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. So how can you help? Because most of us on this call probably aren't going to have a waif tortoise in our um, life and we probably aren't um, likely to have enough land that is gopher tortoise habitat to be a recipient site. But there's lots of little ways we can help. So if you have gopher tortoise habitat or you know there's a gopher tortoise somewhere in your neighborhood, you can plant native plants that they love in your backyard. And there is a whole list on the FWC website of plants that they like, so I have a link for that here. Certainly, as we've talked about, you want to keep pets and kids away from their burrows. So sometimes even if we're well-meaning or we're just excited, um, we might be interacting with gopher tortoises or their burrows a little bit too closely. So we want to maintain a distance. You want to avoid disturbing the area around the burrow. You never want to block the opening of the burrow or walk on the apron. So usually how we figure out a gopher tortoise is around is we see that burrow and we see that big pile of sand, that apron, and we get excited. And I see it every day when I'm walking um, with youth or adults. Of course, us adults can contain ourselves a little bit better, but even us adults get excited when we see something like a gopher tortoise burrow. So um, it's really important not to get so excited that you walk on top of that apron because once again there might be eggs in there and because they only lay five to nine eggs, they're not like sea turtles. Sea turtles can lay hundreds of eggs and we know that even sea turtles have problems replacing their population. Gopher tortoises only lay five to nine eggs a year and they're up against 
all the other wildlife that wants to eat their eggs. They're up against being disturbed. They're up against just something going wrong that year. So we wanna be really careful not to disturb the burrow or the apron of sand. If you see a gopher tortoise on the road, it is actually legal. You are allowed to pick them up and move them. You're not allowed to put them in your car. You're not allowed to transport them somewhere else. All you're allowed to do is pick them up and carry them in the direction they were going to the side of the road they were going to, to get them out of the road. So that's allowed, um, but don't move it to a different area. And certainly also don't put your own life in danger just to move a tortoise. And I've seen that. I saw somebody the other day stop. I think it was on 41, which if you're not from Sarasota, that's a big, fast moving road. And um, this person stopped on 41 in the middle of like the three lanes, stopped in the middle lane, got out of his car, tried to stop all the cars that were coming in both directions so that two sandhill cranes could cross the road. And it warmed my heart, but I also was like just praying and putting all sorts of energy out there that nothing was going to happen to that great guy who was trying to save those sandhill cranes because, you know, the cars are just coming at him 45 mm -hmm. miles per hour. So be a good wildlife friend, but make sure you keep yourself safe. Um, educating others is really obviously a great tool. It's what we here do at UF IFAS Extension. It can really make a difference for people to understand more about these different species and grow to love them as well and become an advocate for our environment, our wildlife. Um, so feel free to share this information and talk to your friends and family. Um, there's also a Go for Tortoise smartphone app. I had completely forgotten about this. Um, so if you want to get the gopher tortoise app, you can take a picture of gopher tortoises that you see. And that information is used by biologists to learn more about where gopher tortoises are and what they're doing. If you see a dead gopher tortoise, there is actually a reporting form on the FWC website so they can also keep track of that information because all of this information just helps the biologists better understand the species. And then there is also a report hotline. If you see someone, and this isn't just for gopher tortoises, it's really for any wildlife. So if you see someone abusing wildlife or doing something you think they shouldn't be doing, then the FWC has a phone number and an email that you can anonymously report your a potential violation to. So we're almost done. I'm pretty much right on time. Um, so I mentioned the Master Naturalist program. So on the left-hand side of the screen, there is a link to Master Naturalist classes. I do not have any listed. These classes are taught all throughout the state of Florida. I don't currently have any listed, but I should be teaching some virtually. Right now they're being taught virtually because of our COVID situation. I will probably teach one or two of them virtually in the fall. I just haven't gotten exact dates together yet. And then on the right hand side are all the webinars that I'm doing coming up for the public. So you can register for any of those on Eventbrite, just like you registered for this one. Um, and so you can see there's three other wild Sarasota ones. I'm doing one on prescribed fire in August. I'm excited to do that one. And then in, later in August, we'll talk about the scrub jay. And in September, we'll talk about panthers and bobcats. And then um, we have uh, one coming up oh, later this week, I guess, I guess that's Friday, Working Outdoors Safely. That's, um, that's for volunteers, but also anybody that works outdoors. We're just going to talk about some of the things you have to watch out for, like heat exhaustion and wildlife and sun protection and things like that. And then right there in the middle is freshwater ecology preview. This will actually be about an hour and a half preview of what we talk about in the freshwater ecology master naturalist program. Um, a couple of you that are here today were on the one I did the other week on uplands. And so um, I share a bunch of education about the freshwater ecosystem. And then we talk about the master naturalist program 
in case you want to learn more about that program. So that's what's coming up. Of course, we have tons of other classes. These are just the ones I'm teaching. We have tons of other people here. So check out our Eventbrite or our Sarasota County Extension website to learn more about things you might be interested in. So this is my favorite quote. It's actually um, in the Master of Naturals program. So it's probably their favorite quote too. Uh, but I, it just really strikes a chord with me. In the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand. And we will understand only what we are taught. So I hope that in our current crazy situation that we're all in, that you're getting some time outdoors, that you're spending some time in nature to connect with yourself and with our natural environment. Um, I hope to see you at more of my classes so that um, hopefully I've shared something new with you today or will in the future. Um, if anything else comes up, you can always send me an email at my email address. I hope that you all stay healthy and happy and please feel free to join me for an upcoming webinar.